I'm excited. I'm so, I'm so excited for today's word. Um, this one came on me quick, and so I'm hoping I can do justice to what God spoke to me, what he, what he has shown me in this text. Um, you can go ahead and sit for a moment. I'm not going to make you stand right back up, but we're reading out of Genesis chapter 32, starting at verse 22. We're in a new series, The Heroes in Faith, The Heroes of the Faith. We're going to be looking at different people throughout the Bible, men and women. And we're going to be looking at the impact that their faith had in those moments. And how that thing, that that momentary glimpse of true faith is not only stuck in that scripture, but it is available today, right now in your life. Heroes in faith. There's always nice to have somebody to look up to. And of course the obvious answer is we want to look up to Jesus, uh, obviously. But the thing is, I don't always relate to Jesus. He had way more patience than I do, and he had way more grace than I tend to have, and he was way more uh, quiet and soft-spoken. And so I don't always identify with him as much as I would like to. But there's some other people in the Bible that I definitely relate to. Paul is my man. That Peter and Paul are like my, my two guys. It's like, it's, between the two of them, there's enough dysfunction in God's grace to let me know there is hope for anybody. That I can make a fool of myself and God will not only redeem me, he'll use what I did or what I said to use to to magnify his power. And so we're going to be looking at just several of these different people. And and today we're going to be looking at Jacob. Uh, Lots of stories to talk about with Jacob. But as soon as I knew I was going into this series, this is the moment, this is the scripture that came to me. And so if you are finally ready to stand to your feet for the reading of the word of God, it is in Genesis Chapter 32, starting at verse 22. It's a whole six verses, and, and my, my scripture I'll be reading from is ESV. That's the English Standard Version, and one up on the screen is American, American Standard Bible, ASB, I think it is. And so you'll see some differences, and you might be reading from different translation yourself, but you'll all get the gist, and I'm, I'm hoping we can land this plane together. Are you all ready? Two people, praise God. The rest of you all just try to keep up, right? That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives. I'm not going to get into this. He took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. Verse 24, these five words. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with humans, and you have overcome. I don't know about you, but I am an overcomer. That is, that is my identity in Christ. I am an overcomer. And I'm hoping by today you will realize that you are also an overcomer. That you have been through some stuff. You have wrestled with God. You might be wrestling with God today. But he is going to show up and he's going to show you that you can overcome anything that you are going through. Amen? So, Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your spirit. Lord, let it dwell in us, upon us. Guide our words, guide our steps, that they might be aligned with your will. Lord, remove me out of the way. Speak through me. Use me as a microphone. But, Lord, don't let me hinder what you want to happen in this service. I ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said... Amen. Go ahead and sit down, church. Get comfortable. Jacob is a, is, a, is a fun character to read about. If you know anything, I'll give you some context. He was a twin. He was born along with Esau, his older, uh, older brother. He was born red, and, and, and I always picture like a, like a Clifford monkey version. Does that make sense? You know what Clifford is, the big red dog? I picture a, like a hairy little monkey man coming out. But when he's birthed, it says Jacob was clinging to his heel. He had enough strength to be holding on to his heel as Esau made his way into the birthright of being the firstborn. 
But Jacob means trickster. It means, it, it means that, that he spent his life manipulating, conniving, getting his way by tricking other people. It is a description of who he was and, and how he functioned all the way up until this text. Jacob. And I'm reading this, and I'm, I'm reflecting on my own life, and of course I have kids, and so I always try to relate to it. But when I was a kid, one of my favorite things to do was to wrestle. I had younger brothers, and, and there's something about boys. I, girls do it too. My girls love to wrestle, but I, I, eventually they'll grow out of it, and they'll become more like the, the princesses that they are. And they'll stop wanting to touch bugs and play in dirt. And I get all that. And I'm kind of dreading those moments because I still enjoy wrestling with them. I still love throwing them on the bed and, and duct taping them together. That's a whole experience in itself. If you need like 10 minutes, grab a roll of duct tape and just go to town. They love it. They can't get enough of it. Just make sure it's on shirts and clothes and not skin. That's a whole different conflict. And don't ask me how I know this, but just trust me. Duct tape is a great way to keep them occupied for a good 10, 15 minutes. And... And what I love to do is my, my little one, Anthony, he is a boy's boy. That, that kid does nose dives into my chest without me knowing. He's just, I mean, in the pool, like he, the kid can't swim. He's got floaties on. Doesn't think twice, just jumps in head first. Like none of my girls were like that. He is a boy's boy. And I remember now looking back, I was pretty much the same way. My uncle, who was a big impact in my life at the time and, and still is in many ways, uh, he used to wrestle with me. He was a father figure to me. And so I remember in so much detail him being on the bed and we're like, he's throwing me on the bed. And he's body slamming me. And, and of course, as a kid, you love that. And I got it in my mind, I'm going to take him out. I'm going to show him how strong I am. I'm about 28 at the time. And no, I'm kidding. I was probably about, I was probably about six, five or six in that range. And, and he's standing next to the bed and he's got a pillow in his hand. He's going to smack me with the pillow. I remember just charging and diving full force and speared him dead in his chest, just full head on into his chest and knocked the wind out of him. And I was convinced I won. Like, I don't know if he even remembers it, but I remember, like, that was my first victory in battle. Like, I took him down. Like, we were done at that point. Like, he couldn't breathe and he stopped and it was over. And there's something about testing your strength with somebody else. Man, do you know what I'm talking about? There's something about challenging another man, arm wrestling, wrestling, whatever it might be, to, to see where you compare to somebody else. To, to know that, like, if you're anything like me, you're always victorious. Amen? And so that's one of the things I've always loved doing. And as I read this text, I, 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 I came to the realization that so many people in the church have come to me. Not this church, but in churches in general, or as a pastor. And one of the things they always tell me is, I'm struggling, I'm wrestling with God. And for some reason, that has a negative connotation to it, that I'm wrestling with God, as if they don't want to be wrestling with God. But I want to tell you that if you're wrestling with God, you're exactly where you should be. As a matter of fact, there's no better place than to be wrestling with God. Now, it's nice when you have overcome, and, and you're like Jacob, and, and you've, you've kind of won the situation, you received the blessing. But the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, we go from wrestling to wrestling to wrestling, don't we? It's never just a one-time wrestling match. It's a continual round after round after round. And we seem to be wrestling with God a lot. And as Christians, we begin to think there's something wrong with us if we find ourselves wrestling with God. And, I, and there's many reasons why we wrestle with God. I mean, there's, there's some of you that were told exactly what God wants you to do, and you don't want to do it, and so you wrestle. Some of you, God didn't tell you what to do. You're just afraid that he's going to tell you to do something you don't want to do. And so you're just wrestling. Not necessarily even with God at that point. You're kind of wrestling with yourself. But you're assuming God is somebody that you're wrestling against. Maybe, maybe, it's, a, maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a stronghold in your life. And, and God is saying, I want to set you free from this. But you're holding on to it because you can't imagine life without it. And so what do we do? We, we wrestle with God. I think every season brings a new match. It brings a new opportunity to compare our strengths and try to wrestle with God. And being a good father that he is, I think he enjoys the wrestling a little bit too. And what I want to do is I think there's three things that happen when you wrestle with God. And I want to give you a different perspective on this situation, this, these circumstances where you find yourselves going at odds with God and something that's in your life. And so if you're ready for point one, go ahead and write this down. First thing you'll discover is who you are. 
When you are wrestling with God, the first thing you learn, the first thing you realize is what's inside of you right now. The things inside of your heart, the things inside of your mind come forth. The true you, who you are in that moment comes out when you are wrestling with him. You see, in in this situation, I I love this, and, and this is some advice, please take this to heart, that sometimes you have to get rid of the distractions in your life so God can wrestle with you. And this is, Jacob sends his two wives away, his 11 kids, his, his, his servants away. And then on top of it, he gets rid of his possessions. And it says those, those beautiful five words. And so Jacob was left alone. And please hear me. The wives are not a distraction. Children are not a distraction. Your job is not a distraction. These, these things that you do on a daily, they're not distractions, but we turn them into distractions. Do you understand the difference? Facebook is a distraction. I'm just being real with you. Like with the exception of Sundays when we're having Facebook Live, hi everybody, it is a distraction the rest of the time. Social media, our cell phones, they're distractions. Our wives, our husbands, our children, the responsibilities we have, we treat them like distractions. We allow them to distract us, but the truth is they are a priority. In order for Jacob to have this encounter with God, he had to come to a place where he was no longer distracted. And so he sends his wives away, his 11 children and his servants and his possessions, and he is left alone. And there's this amazing story that I, I, I love to tell, and I've, I haven't told it in a while. I don't think you guys have probably heard it. But there was a man who was struggling with panic attacks, anxiety attacks. Have you ever had one of those? They say it's comparable to a heart attack. You feel like you're having a heart attack. When your heart starts to race, you get calm, uh, clammy, and your body begins to shake, and, and you feel out of control, and your mind is swirling. And this man's having panic attacks. And he goes to the doctor, and he asks him, you know, what, what, what's wrong with me? Am I having a heart attack? Am I dying? Is there, is there something I need to change? And he looks at him and goes, you need to calm down. As a matter of fact, here's my doctor's note. Go home, sit in a room alone by yourself, and just be calm. And so the man takes the, the advice, and he goes home, and he sits in his library, and he puts on some Mozart and some Beethoven and some Bach, and he's reading his favorite uh, books and his favorite authors, and he's, he's reading poetry, and, and he has another panic attack. He goes back to the doctor, and he goes, I spent two days doing exactly what you said, and I'm still stressed. I'm still overridden with this panic, this anxiety. What's wrong? And he goes, well, tell me what you did the past two days. And he says, well, I, I went home and I, I listened to my favorite, my favorite classical music and I, I read my favorite authors and I, I listened to poetry and, I, 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 and the doctor stops him. He goes, I didn't tell you to go and listen to music. I didn't, I didn't tell you to go and read books. I didn't tell you to go read your favorite authors and poetry. Those things are all nice, but I told you to go home and be alone. And the man says, with his head down low, he goes, I couldn't imagine worse company. And this is where so many of us find ourselves. God desperately wants to speak to you. But the truth is, in order to clearly hear him, to get in the match, get in the ring with him, to wrestle with him, it requires no distractions. But when there's no distractions, all that's left is you. And some of us have such a hard time because when it's just us and there's nothing to to pull our attention away, we don't like what we see. And so we don't hear God because we like distractions in our life. And so this first thing that Jacob is discovering with all distractions out of the way, with everything that is normally pulling his attention, is who he is in this moment. And I wonder, I wonder, am I alone in this that there's a part of me that is terrified to be alone before God. I no longer have my kids to use as an excuse why I'm not reading more. I no longer have my, my possessions to say that I'm distracted by all these things that require my attention. When you stand before God without anything between you, you have to be honest with who you are in front of him. And more importantly, who God says you are. Jacob wrestles with him but it took him being left alone. And so my goal for you today, our first goal, is that you would understand, come to a greater understanding of who you are right now in the presence of God. Some of you won't discover that until you make the decision, though, to clear everything out of the way, to remove every obstacle, to remove everything, so you have some room to wrestle with him. 
Amen? Are you all ready for point two? Point two? This is, this is, I would say equally if not more challenging. Ready? You will face who you were. You have to face who you were. This is one of the greatest perpetuated lies in Christianity. Ready? I got saved. Jesus loves me. I've been redeemed. I've been healed. The, the, the blood of Christ washes me as white as snow. My past doesn't exist anymore. There's the lie. See, the past still exists because you are not who you are today without your past. You can't become who you are, who you're meant to be, without understanding that God was in your past, as bad as it might have been. You see, so many of us, we, we get to this place where we don't want to acknowledge, we don't want to see, we don't want to talk about it. We avoid people that remind us that, or that we're in our past because we're afraid they'll see only that in us. And so one of the things that you will have to do when you are wrestling with God is face who you used to be. You will have to face who you were, the decisions you made, because God wants to use you in the capacity of your past. You see, your past ultimately determines where you're going. And, it, and, and please hear this in a positive way, not a negative way. You are not the person that made those mistakes. You're not that person. You are a new creation. But just becoming a new creation doesn't wipe the slate clean of who you used to be. Yes, you are forgiven, you are redeemed, and you are bought at a price. The blood of Jesus covers you. But that is your testimony. You don't think Jesus was in that season? You don't think he saw you making mistakes. You don't think he saw you falling down. You don't think he was patiently waiting for everything to be stripped away, for you to come to the conclusion that I need a Savior? That, that testimony was not outside of God's reach. That, that who you used to be is not outside of what God can use. And most often, it is our greatest asset when it comes to reaching others for Christ. Who we used to be. And I, I love it because he asked them this question. They're wrestling. They're going back and forth. He pops the man's hip out. And it says it wasn't a blow. It wasn't a forced blunt hit. It was him touching it with his finger. The finger of God knocked his hip out of the socket. Why? So he could come to this place where he says, let go of me. And this will describe where Jacob is today. He goes, I will not let go of you until you bless me. In every other season of his life, he did not fight like this. He manipulated, he coerced, he challenged, he, he, he changed the situation by being a trickster. By, by getting his way, manipulating the circumstances in every season up to this point. But now here he is grappling with God and it's not going to work. All he can do is sheer willpower in the midst of agonizing pain, being exhausted. The man's in his 70s, 80s at this point, And he's refusing to let go of the man. He's refusing to let go of God. Because I will not let go until you bless me. But see, he had to look back. He had to know that, that he is about to encounter his brother Esau. See, if we read a few verses before this, the sheer fear of meeting his brother who he stripped the birthright away from by tricking him, by tricking his father. See, all this is in, in the context of what's going through this man's mind. He is tired of being who he used to be. And so he's trying something new. For the first time, we see him fighting and, and holding out and doing the right thing in, in spite of who he used to be. You see, two things will happen when you get challenged. You'll either return to what you know and how you used to do things, or you will try something new. And for Jacob, that's where we find him. He is doing something new. He's refusing to let go. He does not want to stop wrestling until he is blessed. And some of y'all in here, and, and this is the thing, he fought overnight. Jacob was fighting through the night. It's about daybreak. But some of you have been fighting for years. You have been wrestling with God for years. Some of you have been wrestling with God your entire lives. And I understand that you're exhausted and you might have got some bumps and some bruises along the way. But here's the promise. If you don't let go of God, he will bless you through it. So it doesn't matter how long the season has been, how long you have been holding on. At the end of the season, when you are done and God says you win, 
you're blessed. Do you understand that? That means in every situation, if you are wrestling with God in it, hold on. Don't let go, because the other opportunity that you have is to walk away from God. You hold tight, or you walk away. My fear is that we will give up when we are about two inches away from the finish line. That we will be on the, the border, the cusp of entering into victory where God is going to bless you through something and you will give up because you can't see beyond your physical, your mental circumstances. Jacob says, I am not letting go. It's one of the tricks that the Marines actually use. I remember reading this. What they would do is they would tell you that we're going to run 10 miles. They'll tell you exactly where the point is where they're going to be finishing. You want to know what happens to those people that are in expectation that the season's going to end where they thought it was going to end? They mess with them. They keep running. You want to know what happened? Those who thought that, that this is as far as we have to go, this is it, this is all I have to do, they give up. They get to that marker and they have nothing left inside of them. But those who knew that they were going to be messed with, those who knew that they were going to have to run further, went further, went longer, the same exact thing could happen to you. If you have some expectation of when your season is going to come to an end, that, that if, if God decides that we're going to keep wrestling a little bit longer, you might give up before you're supposed to. Jacob held on. He says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And what's amazing is before this moment, before this interaction with Jacob, God was known as the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac. That's it. Something shifts in this interaction. Something changes in the paradigms of who God identifies himself with. You ready for point three? In the midst of wrestling with God, you'll see who you are becoming. You have to know who you are. You have to know where you came from. And most importantly, if you're paying attention, you'll come to an understanding. You'll see what you are becoming with God. I love this verse. It says, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. I mean, do, do you understand what, what just took place here? A man whose entire life was defined by how he would get his own way using his tricks and manipulation has just been renamed to Israel. That something shifted in him. Something happened between God. There was a change where God saw him. I love that he asked the question, what is your name? Now, if I ask you, what is your name? You might tell me my name is Tom, John, Manuel, I don't know. You'll give me your name, but what I'm asking is, what, what do you identify yourself with? How do you see yourself? Because Jacob was an identity of his being a trickster, a manipulator, getting his own way. He was, you'll no longer be that anymore. And so many of us say, well, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm depressed. I'm, 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 I'm angry. I'm bitter. I'm frustrated. I'm, I have this hatred inside of me. I have this, this, this thing inside of me. That's what I am. You want to know what I am? That's what I am. I have these things, these beasts inside of me. That's who I am. And God looks at you and says, that's not who you are anymore. You see, because the moment you start wrestling with God, things change. It's, it's when you stop wrestling with God that those identities have a platform now. You want to know when you were depressed before you met Christ. If you're still struggling with depression, it means you're wrestling with God. And you should be praising him because he has not given up on you yet. If you're still going through sorrow, if you're still going through mourning, if you're still going through these things, keep going through it. Keep fighting. Keep fighting with God about it. Because here's the thing. Eventually, you'll win. We, we give up so quick, and, and, and this is what Jacob teaches us in this. This is why he's a hero in the faith, because in spite of who he was in the past, or how he was still struggling in the present, God says, in the future, that's not who you are anymore. He held on long enough to receive his new identity. And so some of you came in, you asked Christ to change you, and he took some things away from you. But there's still things you're struggling with. 
You might still have anger. You might still be really sad and depressed. But here's the thing. Keep fighting. Keep holding on to Keep wrestling with God and you'll see something happen. He will call you by a new name. See, this is the, the most important step. Because your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Because, past tense, you struggled with God and with humans. And you have overcome. Past tense, while he is still wrestling with God, he declares that you wrestled with God and with humans. Past tense. Your testimony determines who you become. It's the greatest tool in your arsenal that God wants to use passionately inside of you. And it's you realizing that simple fact. Understanding, coming to the place where you just accept that some of you have struggled and you have fought your entire lives. I, I've heard so many stories of just like men and women surviving things that most people would give up on. And then for some reason we look down on ourselves as if there's something wrong with us because we survived some things. Are you kidding me? Think, think about how twisted that is. Like, there, there are, I've met women that were literally trafficked and gone through these horrible experiences with men who hurt them and, and just being, things being forced upon them and all these different circumstances. And then when they come out of it, they sit there and say, well, don't look at me. I'm ashamed of what I've done. Are you kidding me? You survived. Like, you, you're a beast. You guys have survived things. You've survived cancer. You've survived arguments and, and things between you and your spouse. You've survived sickness, scares, and financial hard times. Look back on your life and look how much time you have spent fighting in prayer and realize God has always been faithful. That you guys are here. Do you want to know why you're here right now? Do you want to know why you're here in this moment to hear this word? Because you are an overcomer. That's what it is described as. Yes, you have overcome. Does that mean that you're not going through something? Of, of course not. You want to know what happens immediately following this text? Jacob wrestles with him, and it's like nothing ever happened. And he starts walking towards his brother Esau, who he was terrified was out to kill him. All of a sudden, after wrestling with God, he was no longer afraid of his life. He was no longer worried about Esau. He walked up to him. And he says, I am sorry, I am your servant, I am here before you. And Esau embraces him. He was afraid of what might happen. Think about that. He, he, Jacob was grasped by the fear that, that Esau was out to kill him. And Esau just wanted to embrace his brother. There are things that you're running away from that God wants to use to heal you. Since the moment that he stole the birthright, Jacob had been running from Esau. Every decision was made to keep away from him. And while we're running, while we're running away from the things that we're terrified of, the very thing we're trying to keep away from, God is trying to use. Like, yes, I get it. You've been divorced and that marriage sucked. I get it. Things happen. You made decisions. It's over. But there's healing in it. There's something in it that God wants to use. It's in the midst of all this. It, it's, it really is like a fire. That, that's what he, and, and when things seem like they're getting worse, he's just upping the fire. Why? Because it, in order to be purified, you have to go through the fire. In order to have those impurities, those things that we talked about, removed from us, you have to go through the fire. You can't spend your life running away from the heat and think that everything is going to change. It won't. You'll change locations. You'll change relationships. You'll change beds. You'll, you'll go from thing to thing, person to person. But if you're not willing to embrace the heat, you'll stay the same always. The same decisions. And that's what this was. This entire wrestling match, it was a flame for Jacob. He was being refined in the fire. And I can't venture to guess what you guys are going through. I really can't. And, and and I wish I knew and I could sympathize to every single one of you. And, and the truth is, most of you would never tell me because it's so personal that you don't think I'll understand. I get that. But I know that you're going through something. Do you want to know how I know this? Because everybody's going through something. And we'll downplay it and make it seem as if it's not that bad and nobody really understands me and I'm special and I'm unique. But the truth is, it's just another fire. 
It's just another opportunity. God wants to refine you. He wants to pull those things out of you. And what I want us to do is, in this moment, I, I want us to start throwing things in the fire. I want us to start, to start being intentional, using the wrestling match that we're in with God to see more healing. Are you wrestling with God about anything? You don't have to say what it is, but I mean, show, I show, I'm wrestling with God. Oh, I wrestle with him daily. And it changes. Like I overcome something and, and, and it's like another wrestling match comes up. Ding, ding, I'm back in the ring again. And, and, but I'm always wrestling. And what I realized was that's a good place to be. If you're wrestling with God, praise him because that's exactly where you want to be. And so if you came in this morning, you're wrestling with him. What I want you to do is I want everybody to stand to their feet. This song that we're about to, to have sung over us, some of you might know the lyrics. But what I want us to do is I, and it's going to sound counterproductive, I get it, but I, I want you to ask God to increase the heat. I, I want you to ask God to increase the flames. You know what's going to happen? It's not going to be fun. But when you come out on the other side, when you've gone through the refiner's fire, when you've gone through all this, you know what happens? You are transformed from Jacob to Israel. Transformation happens in the flames. And so right before you, you don't see it, but there's a flame that is burning in front. You are like Moses with a burning bush. And what I want you to do is I want you to take those things that are inside of you that you walked into this church with, or maybe you left it in the car. Maybe you came in and wanted to be super spiritual and act like you got everything all together, and most of you might actually have everything together. But for a lot of us, we have nothing together. We put a good show on, we make it look good, we smile all beautiful, but we feel like we're falling apart. Here's the place that you throw it in the fire. Go after God. Don't let go of him. Don't, don't stop fighting until you see the blessing. And so I want to pray for us, and we're going to sing this song together. If you need prayer, you can come forward, and, and I will pray for you. We're going to go into a time of, of communion and, and tithes and offerings after the song. And so use this time to prepare your heart for what God wants to speak to you as we go before the table to receive the elements. But right now, where you are, before we do anything else, I want this song just sung over us. And for you to have an opportunity to get these things off of your chest. Get these things off of your back. Allow God to begin to remove those impurities so that you are refined before the King. Father, thank you. Thank you that, that, that you never give up on us. Thank you that no matter how many times we have said we're done, we tap out, you still keep rest, you still keep the match going, you still keep pulling us towards you. Father, help us be like Jacob this morning. That we refuse to let go, that we have this, this boldness in our faith to say, I will not let go of you until you bless me. I will not let go of you until I overcome this thing in my life. I will not let go of you until I receive my healing. I will not let go of you until I see my child redeemed. I will not let go of you until I see the promises that you said in your word come into fruition. I will not let go. And we can say this with so much confidence to know that you will never let go of us. I love you, Jesus. Transform us here and now. We ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.